War and Revolution, Section The October Revolution, Nazism and Fascism, and the Colonial Question Thus we arrive at the main phenomenon repressed by revisionist historiography, the colonial and national question. Not only is its starting point 1917 rather than 1914, but it forgets that, in addition to calling for the transformation of imperialist war into revolutionary civil war, the Bolsheviks also appealed to the slaves of the colonies to break their chains and wage wars of national liberation against the imperial domination of the great powers. Such repression makes it impossible adequately to understand Nazism and fascism, which also represented themselves as a movement in reaction, extreme reaction, against this second appeal. It is no accident if the three countries that took the initiative in unleashing the Second World War were ones which, having arrived late at the colonial banquet, were frustrated in their ambitions and directly threatened by rising anti-colonialism. Thus, Japan sought its living space in Asia, Italy and Ethiopia, Albania and elsewhere, and Germany in Eastern Europe and the Balkans. On the eve of the official commencement of the Second World War, before attacking Poland and the USSR, Hitler dismembered Czechoslovakia and explicitly declared that Bohemia Moravia was a protectorate of the Third Reich. The lexicon and institutions of the colonial tradition were explicitly invoked and their sphere of application extended to Eastern Europe. Hitler's model was Britain's colonial empire, of whose civilizing function and mission he held a very high opinion. Quote, there has never been in Europe, since the disintegration of the old German empire, any state which could compare with the British. End quote. Hitler even expressed concern about, quote, the state of anarchy that will follow British withdrawal from India in the wake of the Axis's triumph. The Ukraine was the new empire of the Indies, and its inhabitants, like those of Eastern Europe generally, were repeatedly characterized as natives. The Italians were called on by the Fuhrer to emulate the British colonial model in Egypt and Africa. The close link between Nazism and fascism, and attempts to block the historical process of liberation of colonial peoples that began with the October Revolution, did not escape the most attentive observers at the time. It was not only the Communist International that defined fascism as the terroristic dictatorship of the most reactionary, the most chauvinist, and most imperialist elements of finance capital. In the same years, the future leader of independent India, Jawaharlal Nehru observed that, quote, A victory of fascism in Europe or elsewhere will strengthen imperialism. Its retreat will weaken imperialism. Equally, the triumph of the liberation movement in a colonial or subject country is a blast against imperialism and fascism. End quote. Imperialism was certainly not coterminous with fascism. The then leader of an important national liberation movement ironized about Britain, quote, The greatest of the imperialist powers, posing as the defender of world peace while it bombs and ruthlessly oppresses subject peoples. End quote. Such irony indicates an awareness that being consistently anti-fascist entailed rejecting imperialism and colonialism. It was no accident, stressed Nehru, if one of the British colonial empire's most fervent admirers was precisely Hitler. There is something we should reflect on. The Second World War began as a colonial war, against colonies in the territories which the aggressors intended to convert into colonies. One thinks of the Italian conquest of Ethiopia, the Japanese conquest of China, and the German invasion, albeit legalized by the Munich Treaty, of Czechoslovakia. Eurocentric prejudice prevents us from appreciating a fact that did not escape a third world leader like Mao Zedong. In May 1938, he observed, quote, By now, one third of the world's population has entered the war. Look, Italy, then Japan, Abyssinia, then Spain, then China. 
the population of the countries now at war amounts to almost 600 million, or nearly a third of the total population of the world. What will come next? Undoubtedly, Hitler will fight the great powers. End quote. For that very reason, from its outset, the second global conflict exhibited radically different characteristics from the first. The main difference consisted in the emergence of a new political subject. In a way, of course, the latter had already emerged between 1914 and 18, with the enrollment of non-white troops in Entente ranks and a conflict of which they knew nothing. Twenty years later, the new wave of colonial expansionism pursued by the Nazi and fascist states was confronted, as Mao further observed, by revolutionary wars and liberation movements that had now achieved political subjectivity, thanks also to the epical break represented by the October Revolution. If, at the end of the First World War, Notwithstanding their promises to the peoples they had needed as cannon fodder, the victorious powers not only maintained their empires intact, but calmly appropriated the colonial booty abandoned by the losers. One thinks in particular of the Middle East. The picture changed radically with the Second World War. The resistance was an international phenomenon investing a very wide arc of countries, European and non-European. Not a few of these, within and without Europe, had been reduced to colonial or semi-colonial conditions. We can therefore easily understand why such revolutions, having developed at a global level, should have continued beyond 1945, in a tempestuous dynamic of anti-colonial struggle encompassing all continents. It should be added that the Third Reich's attempt to relaunch colonial expansionism at the expense of countries on its eastern borders, and the Napoleon-style victories, initially won by its army, exacerbated the national question in Europe itself, as Lenin had foreseen. We even have the instance of a country, Italy, which, having participated in unleashing world war with explicitly imperialist slogans, the conquest of a place in the sun, and the return of empire to the fateful hills of Rome, was subsequently forced to fight to avoid itself becoming a province of the greater German Reich. In this sense, despite the bitter elements of civil war it contained, something more or less characteristic of any independence struggle, the Italian resistance is also to be regarded primarily as a war of national liberation. End section.